The Lord be with you. Um, I am Jennifer Brown, and I serve as the pastor here at University Baptist Church, and I'm so grateful that you're with us this morning. We are an inclusive, inquisitive community of faith, and we are glad for your presence among us. If you would like to connect more deeply with us, you are welcome to fill out the card in your pew back and drop it in the offering box which is either up front or in the back. We don't take offering by passing the plate, but rather you can drop it in the box, or you're welcome to scan the QR code that's in your bulletin and give that way. We have a full week this week of lots of social events, so I'm gonna briefly highlight them for us. And so, first of all, Zach Jackson's first day with us is tomorrow. We're very excited for him to get the hit, hit the ground running in the office. Um, But next Sunday, we're going to have a welcome breakfast, so you can get to know Zach. We'll uh, play some get-to-know-you games, and so have a good time and also wonderful food. So we hope that you'll mark that on your calendar. Be here for that. This Thursday, we are going to have a group of us over at Mobe Beignet Company from 9 to 1030 for a concert. It's part of Festival South featuring the Viola Ensemble. So if you want to come out, sit with us, have some fun fellowship time, we'd love that. Friday, our families are meeting at the water park at 1 o'clock, and so we have a cabana, so you won't get sunburnt, hopefully, Um, and we're really excited about that. Check out the water park, have some time together, and then that evening is Festival South's program called Beertoven, and so if you're interested in that, you can buy tickets online, Um, but if you're there, we hope to kind of sit together and be present to that. And then Sunday, next Sunday, on June 16th, the Meister Singers will be performing their concert Sunday afternoon at Westminster Presbyterian, and we have some of our church members who are involved in that. And so if you would like to turn out and support them, they would definitely appreciate that. So with all of those announcements made, I'll invite us now to draw our attention to the Spirit of God in this place, here among us, as we center down and listen to our prelude.
Please join me in the call to worship. Strange one, fabulous one, fluid and ever becoming one. Do not allow us to make our ideas of you into an idol. You are as close to us as our own breath, and yet your essence transcends all that we can imagine. You are mother, father, and parent. You are sister, brother, and sibling. Embodied in us, your creation, we recognize our flesh in all its forms is made holy in you. With thanksgiving, we celebrate your manifestation in all its glorious forms. Blessed are our bodies. Blessed is our love. Blessed are we when we celebrate that which the world turns away. Fill our hearts with a pride rooted in resistance to all that seeks to destroy. May we delight in the ways you have created us, diverse, unique, surprising, and beautiful. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 407, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. this prayer adapted from Terry York in the Baptist hymnal. Dear God, thank you for our family. 
Who is our family? We are family by heritage, by community, by humanity. Who is our sister? Who is our brother? We are brothers and sisters of all for whom Christ died. Who is our child? We are the parents of all children who need care and love and protection. Who is our parent? We are the children responsible for all the elderly who are vulnerable, weak, and lonely. By the grace of God, we will embrace and nurture our family. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament Psalms 138. In your pew Bible, it's on pages 569. I printed it larger. <laughs> I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. For the word of God in scripture, for word, the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. At this time, I'll invite our children forward for our story for all ages. Let's find our seats here. All right. So you know something that I love to do in summer is eat fruit. So I was wondering if we could name some fruits. What are some fruits that we know? What do you think? Bananas and apples. Those are great. Pineapple. And pineapple. That's a good fruit. What other fruits do we have? Blueberries and strawberries and blackberries. Yeah, but if they're red, they're not black. Yeah, if they're red, they're not black yet. That's true. You have to wait for them to ripen. And if blueberries are green and red, they're not ready. Right, right. You have to wait until they're blue for the blueberries to be ready. And did you know, you know, even a kiwi and mango, have you ever had those? Or grapes? I bet you've I had grapes. grapes. You've had grapes before? I've never had a watermelon. Uh, oh, well, maybe you'll have some watermelon this summer. That would be a good fruit. Yeah? Watermelon? Well, in the Bible, we are told about a different kind of fruit. They're called the fruits of the Spirit. Has anybody ever heard about the fruits of the Spirit? No. No? Well, we're going to hear about them today. So I'm going to find our scripture here, and I'm going to read our verse. Now, the fruits of the Spirit, they're not actual fruits. So let me tell you what they are. Let's see. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So there's nine fruits of the Spirit. That's a lot of fruits, right? We named a lot of fruits. And so those are things that, because of the Holy Spirit, that we can practice. So have you ever been able to practice love? No. No? Well, I think you'll have an opportunity this week. You can love your parents. You can love your friends. You can love the water park. You can love um, and practice joy when you get to do something fun, right? Like go to the pool in the summer. I have a pool. 
you have a pool. Well, that's joyful all the time then. And you can practice kindness and generosity. Yeah, but I and don't so have a pool. that's okay. I don't have a pool either. So the fruits of the Spirit are important for us to practice. And so for us to remember that, and you may already have one of these, Clara, I'm going to let everybody here pick a button that has a fruit on it. Can we pick a button here? Would you like to pick a button from my bag? Oh, those are, yep, pick one of those for me. So oh, we only have kiwi or pineapple. So those are, those are your choices this morning. Okay. Kiwi because mom Okay, here you go. Kiwi. All right, here, we're just going to, we're going to hand these out. All right, so we are now, I hope you remember when you wear it about the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to lead our folks in our prayer that Jesus taught us. Are we ready? Are we ready? All right, let's lead them and say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may return to your seats. Thank you. Join me in prayer. Creator God, we give you thanks for all of the new life and all of the new things you are doing in our community. We pray your blessings upon Festival South and the continued arts activities that are going on across our city. And we ask that you would make us light as we experience those arts, that people might be drawn to our witness. We pray your blessing upon Zach as he prepares to begin his new position with us tomorrow, that he might feel both welcomed and excited about all of the work you have in store. We pray your blessings upon our homebound members, God, that you would draw near to them and help us keep them at the front of our minds. We pray your blessing upon those who are gathered here to worship, that we might hear something we need to God through liturgy or word or music, that our hearts might be encouraged. There's much in our world, God, that makes our hearts heavy. And we continue to pray for the war in Gaza, for the Israeli hostages, for the Ukraine, for the outbreaking violence in the Sudan. And we ask that you would give us energy to help transform where we can, and continue to have the passion and the drive to bring about your work in your kingdom. We thank you for how you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 4 through 20. You can find it in your Pew Bible on pages 248. I am also going to be reading from the NRSV version. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me from being king over them. 
just as they have done to me from the day that I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the men of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground, to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtyards. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtyards. He will take your male and female slaves, the best of your cattle, donkeys, and put them to work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. John Mark and I first met on... I'm sorry, there's an anthem. (laughs) Woo, all right. So 
I'm going to take two here. <laughs> okay. John Mark and I first met on December 1st, 2017. We met for what was going to be a quick conversation check-in, and four hours later, we were kindly asked to leave the establishment we were at because they were closing. But one of the things that I remember that we talked about a lot was Cracker Barrel. <laughs> now, we were two Tennessee kids all the way out in Colorado, and Cracker Barrel is from Tennessee. It's from Lebanon, Tennessee, not Lebanon, Lebanon. And so Lebanon, Tennessee is where Cracker Barrel was founded. It's modeled after the country general stores that would have existed in the 19th and 20th century in America. The ones up north had big potbelly stoves that folks would gather around, and the ones down south had big, wide porches for folks to linger on. And so Cracker Barrel kind of combined the two into one. And all over the walls are kitsch and antiques. And you may not know this, but they're actually real antiques. Cracker Barrel is one of the biggest buyers of antiques in this country. And so if you ever look at the walls, those are not reproductions. Everything gets shipped to Lebanon, and then their designers place everything out and how they're going to set up the store. And then it all gets shipped to the store to get set up. But what Jamark and I were talking about is the fact that your service is wholly dependent on the apron that your server wears. Anybody who's been to Cracker Barrel knows they have categories, okay? So if you have a rising star, you're in for a rough one, okay? Her name's probably Kaylee or Lexi, right? She's new, she doesn't know what she's doing. So you just take a deep breath and you're gonna be patient with her. And then you might get somebody a little older, maybe an Amanda, you know, two stars, but, but still, you know, has the spirit in her. But the best servers at Cracker Barrel, John Mark and I both agree, are your four stars. They are a rarity. That is a Betty Jean, a Barbara Ann, the woman who just woke, walked back in from chain smoking and is going to tell you if today's grits are good or not and not waste any time about it. And so as we were waxing about Cracker Barrel, it gave us, us a feeling of nostalgia. Now, nostalgia is something that's really interesting in our culture. Nostalgia is us longing for a previous time and place and history. But nostalgia, while it may give us warm feelings, never really paints a full, accurate picture of what was happening at the time. Nostalgia is just the highlight reel for you to remember the, all the good parts, and you kind of forget or let drift away how bad some of it was. We're in a significant moment of nostalgia in our culture. We hear a lot about how can we make America great again? How can we reclaim former glory? But it's interesting that nostalgia arises when folks have been through a time of intense fear and change. The last time nostalgia peaked in this country, anybody have any guesses which decade? It was the 70s. Nostalgia peaked after the turmoil and the change and the civil rights movement of the 60s. And so nostalgia calls out. Folks wanted to go back, back to way before. In the 70s, there was all this music and movies and cinema that harkened back to the 30s and the 40s. Folks were trying to go backwards a bit. Everything had shifted so much. Today, the Israelites in our scripture are experiencing nostalgia. They want to go back to a former way of being. Last Sunday, we talked about the call of Samuel. Samuel was called to be this judge, this prophet, and this priestly role for Israel. And you know why? We talked about it. Eli's sons were a hot mess. They were the preacher's kids gone awry. Well, Samuel is a wonderful priest and prophet, but if you back up in our scripture, it makes more sense that a king is getting demanded. When Samuel became old, verse 1 of chapter 8 says, he made his sons judges over Israel. That sounds familiar. 
The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abjah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Well, that also sounds familiar. It turns out nepotism doesn't work out well. When Moses appointed judges over Israel, he did so based off of their qualifications. He did not appoint his own children. But Eli appointed his kids, and Samuel appointed his kids, and it's just a disaster. It reminds me a bit of the modern Sackler family, the folks who created our opioid crisis in this country. They appointed family member after family member after family member to their board and to their company to the point where they had no, no wisdom, no outsider saying, you need to stop. This is wrong. And so it ran all the way off the rails. And so here we are again. And Samuel is being asked for him to step aside and appoint a king. He's being told that he's too old to rule. Does that sound familiar? The folks are saying, you're old man and your sons do not follow, so appoint us somebody else. And Samuel, to his credit, does not go, no, you crazy people. <laughs> he goes, I'll take it to God. And so even though he thinks they're wrong, he goes to God and says, God, what do I do? They, they want a king. And God said, this is not about you. <laughs> It's actually about me and the rejection of me. You see, society for the Israelites had been ordered like this. You had a prophet over Israel, and then you would have a priest, and then you would have a ruler, right? And the Israelites are asking for this to be inverted. They're saying they want a king who then a priest relates to, who then a prophet is under, and you see this in David's reign, right? You have King David, and then the, the priest, and then the prophet Nathaniel who comes to him. And so they want to turn upside down this order, this God-ordained governance. And so God shockingly says yes to the people's demands. Have you ever thought about that? That sometimes God might say yes, when we're asking for the wrong thing, when we're demanding to go the wrong direction. But God does warn them. God lists out all of the things and the ways that the king will operate. And the king will exploit not just the people, but the land and the animals. The sin will be both structural and personal. And the people don't care. Samuel lists out all of the ways that this is going to be bad for them. And they just want to be like everybody else. They just want to look like everybody else. The problem is that the Israelites are feeling nostalgic for a ruler. This is not the generation that was enslaved. This is not the generation that died in the wilderness after Egypt. Instead, it's a couple generations after that a generation that has lost the lesson of Egypt, that that power structure itself is corrupt. It cannot be saved. And instead of learning that lesson and being led by God, they say, no, we want that power structure. We just want to be on the top of it. As long as we're on the top, then that's fine. Not understanding that it will corrupt over time. You see that with Saul and then David, and then the rest of the Old Testament, minus King Josiah, bless him, the rest of the Old Testament, the kings are terrible, absolutely terrible. And so we're faced with a hard lesson in our scripture today, and that is you can't bring about the kingdom of God by the ways of the world. You can't create shalom, a whole community by exploiting power. You can't get there by using the tools of the world. I'm reminded of this quote by Audre Lorde, and I want to read it for us this morning. She says, For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. 
They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. Racism and homophobia are real conditions of all of our lives in this place and time. I urge each one of us here to reach down into that deep place of knowledge inside herself and touch that terror and loathing of any difference that lives here. See whose face it wears. Then the personal as the political can begin to illuminate all of our choices. When I was in college, I was a political science major. I thought that was the way I was going to change the world. Perhaps I could do faith-based advocacy. Perhaps I could get those people in D.C. to listen. And I did. I, I lobbied in D.C. I had these meetings with this le these legislative aides to try to get them to pass more food stamps and assistance for poor families. I even ran and ran a judicial campaign in Nashville, and it was awful. And it was awful because I realized that this was not going to bring about the change that I wanted, the wholeness, the, the heart that I desired. There was too much money in it. There was too much power. It was too corrupt for me, myself, to redeem. And so instead, I headed towards the church. But many of us still struggle with that lesson, that lesson that the power of the world cannot build the kingdom of God. Now, for my Dungeons and Dragons folks, this is where you talk about warlocks and how warlocks make a pact that never works out with magic because it always gets called in even though they want to do good. See me after. Okay, so the tools of the oppressor, the tools of the world cannot bring about the kingdom. And so the Israelites make this mistake. They say, I want that structure just like they have, and then it doesn't work out for them. The problem is that their nostalgia has made an idol. Now, growing up, when I heard about idolatry, I always thought about statues, you know, just like the golden calf that people worship. I thought as a kid that was the easiest commandment to keep. You just didn't have to pray to something weird, right? shouldn't be hard. That was way easier than not coveting or, or even stealing. But as I've become an adult, I think idolatry is, in fact, the hardest commandment to keep. Because idolatry itself is disordered desire. It's simply putting something in the place of God. Idolatry is something that asks more and more of you and offers less and less until it asks for everything and gives nothing. I'll say that again, and you can think about it through the lens of perhaps addiction, but you can also think about it through the lens of money or career. Idolatry is something that asks more and more of you and offers less and less until it asks for everything and gives you nothing. I know people who've dedicated their entire life to climbing a career ladder only to be left at the top alone and divorced and estranged from their children. That's idolatry. I know people who refresh their retirement accounts every single morning, worried about the stock market, spewing out its facts every time I talk to them. It's down, it's up. It's made an idolatry out of security and money. The Israelites made idolatry out of this desire to have a king rather than have God. They wanted something physical and tangible. They wanted to feel good about it. But a king is only going to take and take and take. And did you catch the echoes of the king taking one-tenth, one-tenth of livestock, one-tenth of grain and wine? The king is taking what should belong to God. And yet... The Israelites cannot see it. This disordered desire kind of creeps up on us. We don't realize it over time that it's taking the priority in our life. The best way to figure out if idolatry has crept into your life is to ask, how are you spending your day? What do you give the most time to? In our economy, attention is your most valuable gift. That's why your reels roll up automatically on your phone. 
That's why the Netflix show starts uh, immediately, one after another after another. That's why YouTube has that autoplay feature. Your attention is the most valuable thing you have in your life, and society wants to profit off of it. I think one of the most dangerous things is that good things can become idols. I think a lot of people are burnt out on church because that definition has at times applied to it. Something that asks more and more of you and offers less and less until it asks for everything and gives nothing. That's been some folks' experience of church. And so we have to be careful not to become a commodity and not to become an idol in and of ourselves, of our own structure. Now, I'm going to mention the elephant or the donkey in the room, and that is this year is an election year. I know, I know it's coming again. How is it possible? I think First Samuel is an important and timely reminder for us a reminder that sometimes we desire political power, we desire to be in charge, we desire for our person to be at the top of the totem pole. But the reality is the totem pole itself is never going to bring about the kingdom of God. And so I'm not saying disengage. No, I, I want us to pray. I want us to hope. I want us to vote our values. But I want us to remember that the master's tools never bring about true freedom. Our work is the work that Audre Lorde calls ourselves to, to face our own discrimination, our own fear, our own self, and to change ourselves, to change our souls. Because that work and the work that happens in this room, that has the power to build the kingdom. That has the power to change. And so, with dread and fear and hope, we enter this season. And I pray that you'll remember the proper order of things, that God is on God's throne, that no political party is going to save us, and that our true work begins within ourselves. So let's start today. Amen.
As we move into a time of response, I'll invite you to offer your prayers and praises to God. This time is also open if you would like to officially make UBC your church home, or if you would like to become a follower of Christ. Please join us in standing and singing hymn number 634, We Walk by Faith. I invite you to receive an open-eyed benediction from Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.